part two, step three of apologizing to your cat. Walk slowly to your cat. If your cat turns and runs away from you, it may still be angry, upset, or frightened. Do not chase after your cat. Instead, try again in a few minutes. This will reassure your cat that you will not do anything further to harm or annoy it. Have a cat treat ready so that this may also reassure your cat. Section 4. Talk to your cat. Tell it, I'm sorry. <laughs> you may even use your cat's name. Make sure that you're using a soft, calm voice. There we go. Okay, aside. Tonality is very important when someone does not understand what you are saying. So I've messed with a whole lot of foreign languages, and my voice is not the prettiest sounding when I am stumbling over vocabulary that I'm not super confident with using in a language that I'm just not that familiar with. So I very heavily focus on my presentation of my vocabulary rather than just relying on the vocabulary itself, which is going to be shaky, because a huge aspect of how do you convey information about what is your mood, what mood are you trying to convey, is tonality. And when people do language learning, they do not focus enough on tonality, because the whole purpose of learning language, it is a communication skill, and one of those soft skills is giving these like context clues. It's the presentation of your speech, not just the vocabulary alone, but especially when you are talking to a non-human when you're talking to a cat that cannot comprehend to quote data about his wonderful cat spot they cannot comprehend but i still consider you a true and honest friend something like that was his ode to spot uh, nevertheless tonality becomes much more important when you can't reliably depend upon words to get the message across so you know, with animals even though you're like speaking and saying things it may be very natural for us humans to string together a whole bunch of words and that may actually be a good way of getting across a calm tonality where the words just come very naturally but it doesn't matter if they understand or if they don't understand because you're still able to say that very calming sort of tone within your voice i'm sure you could be like humming and it would get the same effect across even though it would actually feel more unnatural for you, the person speaking, because you don't speak in hum. It would sound more natural just stringing together whatever words come to mind, and that would help you like get in more of a genuine calming mindset rather than speaking gibberish. So, continuing with the article. Your cat may not necessarily understand your words, but it will understand your tone. Do not use a loud, shrill voice. Aside, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of cat owners that I've met over the years where they just have loud, shrill voices. I really pity their cats. There's some people where they're not aware of their tonality, and it's just hideous the way that they sound, and they're not pleasant to be around. It's an issue, and I feel really sad for the animals that are exposed to that. Continuing with the article. Cats do have sensitive hearing, and you will only annoy your cat. Living in perpetual annoyment, I could imagine the feeling. Continuing. Consider blinking slowly. A trusting cat will blink slowly. You can show your cat that you trust it by blinking slowly. Aside, I've never heard this. Is this real? Am I being fooled? Is this a fake article? Blinking slowly makes you appear more trustworthy. That's an odd thing. Because like if you're staring at someone, that would be like seen as aggressive. But I mean, cats have a different paradigm that they work off of. I guess if they're calm, they'll stare. That's, that's hard for me to understand. That The jury's still out on that one. Section 5, in apologizing to your cat. Stroke your cat gently in its favorite spot. <laughs> Stroke your cat gently in its favorite spots. Yeah, leave that to the imagination when it comes to uh, genetically engineered cat girls for domestic ownership. <clears throat> Let's be adults about this. Make sure that you take note of your cat's mood. If your cat appears angry or upset, then do not pet her. Refer to the section in this article on reading your cat's body language to learn how to best determine your cat's mood. If you don't know where your cat likes to be pet, here are some suggestions. Scratch behind the ear. An even better place would be to gently stroke the area between your cat's eye and ear. Use the tip of your finger and slowly smooth over the fine hairs there. That's very awkwardly written. Scratch behind the ears. That makes sense. Next. Scratch your cat under the cheek and against the cheek. It may even forgive you for your offense and start rubbing against your hand. Okay, the whole like cheek rub thing makes sense. Next one. Scratch your cat at the base of her tail. Uh, place your fingers on the base of your cat's tail where the tail and the back meet and wiggle your fingers to, uh, gently stretching with your fingers. It's very weird when someone's writing and they're trying to explain a physical motion and... Uh, that was just weird. 
it's hard for me to describe how weird that is, but you know it when you see it. So let's, let's just move on from that one. Cat's favorite places. Next one. Stroke your cat's head, back, and chest. Keep in mind, however, that not all cats enjoy being petted in these areas. Watch your cat's body language and be careful for any signs of annoyance. That's the end of the paragraph. That's another thing that, depending on the cat's breed, they have, like, different things that they enjoy. I forget what it was where some cats, there's some kind of cat where they don't enjoy being scratched behind the ear. You don't want to put your hand anywhere near their face, because that'll make them, like, angry. But they would enjoy, like, being rubbed on the chest instead. That's an example. I don't know if that, like, actually correlates to something. But just as an example, there are different, like, acceptable things. There are different temperamental things. This kind of cat likes this more. That kind of cat doesn't like it. So let's just use it as an example. Let's say a Siamese cat does doesn't like being scratched behind the ears, but it does like to be its chest to be rubbed. But let's say that a Maine Coon doesn't like for its chest to be rubbed, but it likes its ears to be scratched. Which I think that's also not true, because Maine Coons are really affectionate, and they they actually have a very wide chest in comparison just to the anatomy of other cats. It has like a lot of fluff on its chest. I actually don't know if Maine Coons like belly rubs or anything like that, and I'm going to forego any commentary about genetically engineered cat girls there. Just moving to part six, um, section six rather. Play with your cat. Your <laughs> aside, I really like this concept where it would absolutely be an important part of proper ownership for having a genetically engineered cat girl for domestic ownership. A responsible owner would play with your cat regularly. You need to play with your cat, exercise properly to keep her happy. It just improves her mood. So let's read about playing with your cat. <laughs> and I just realized the silly commentary that could be made about that. <clears throat> but moving on. Your cat could be upset with you because you have not been spending enough time with her. If your cat is more energetic, you could consider playing with her. But most cats would enjoy swatting at a piece of string. Here are some ways that you can play with your cat. Toss a piece of crumpled up cellophane or paper. What? Cellophane? Like the tape? Like cellotape? The scotch tape for, you know, those that are familiar with that brand. Cellophane. I don't want it messing with, uh, like, adhesive for one thing, but I wouldn't want it messing with, like, you know, microplastics and all that. Toss a piece of crumpled up paper towards her. You can also use a toy mouse instead. Do not throw the toy at it. <laughs> Whack! <laughs> Just like throw it like a baseball. Hit the cat girl in the head. Instead, aim for a spot just before her paws. Uh, next. Dangle a piece of string in front of your cat. Jiggle it and move it slowly back and forth towards and away from your cat. You can even try running the string across its paws. Next. Purchase a laser pointer and point the laser on a spot on the wall or the floor. That would be a great trick. Well, have a cat girl run after a laser pointer. I'm sure that gag's been done in anime before. Once your cat is paying attention to the dot, move the laser around. She may even try running after the laser. Next. Play with your cat using a cat te cat teaser? What's a cat teaser? Cat I'm it's that fluffy thing on a stick? I, I don't know. Continuing. A cat... Oh, so it's going to explain it. See, here's my brain stopping before reading the next sentence. Uh, continuing. A cat teaser is a long, flexible stick with some feathers or a string attached to one end. Ah, so this is cat fishing. I've seen one of these before. Like, my family had one uh, for the family cat where it looks like a fishing rod because it has, like, you know, a flexible rod. And then there's a string on it. And then there's feathers on the end of the string. So it's a silly thing because it looks like a fishing rod that you that you swing around to play with the cats. Like, I'm going cat catfishing <laughs> and you know i didn't know what a stupid term for catfishing is with like with social media relation the social media connotation rather so it was much uh, more innocent phrase uh, than looking back on it in retrospect so i guess that's a reverse nostalgia where um, my experiences since have made the phrase catfishing much more bitter okay so continuing some teasers also have a bell <laughs> cat teaser I'm, I'm teasing my cat girl with feathers and a, a bell on the end of a stick it's, it's just it's just the absurdity of it. like every once in a while this is another thing when whenever i'm writing i try and like take a step back from the page and just like breathe because if i'm just nose to the grindstone just words 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 then that really lowers my productivity where if i kind of do things in shorter sprints and you know take proper breaks get a glass of water after a half hour of writing or something then i'm much clearer and i write a lot better content and i actually have uh, more words per minute on the page when writing the parody stuff every once in a while i'll just run across an idea that's stupid and makes me laugh and that laughter like it does take you away from the page but in a good way and in, in a giddy kind of way it's it's nice i should have started writing parody things earlier 
yeah, that's my that's my biggest mistake is not writing just parody, all parody, all the time. I might, I don't know, I might be able to do that down the line. I mean, I have a serious sort of paranormal thriller that I am finishing up as uh, my first book to be published, and then I have another. It's like a sci-fi thriller that is going to be the next one after that, and then I have a fantasy one that is like dark fantasy, and then I'll be able to get on to the genetically engineered cat girls book. So as I said, this is a thing that's on the back burner, but I absolutely love the kind of mood to it because out of all those other books I would never get this sort of giddy silly ridiculous mood where I'm imagining okay so I'm in my apartment with a, a cat teaser thing you know a, a, a long flexible rod with some feathers on the end and possibly a bell and I'm swinging that from side to side and just watching a cat girl like her eyes just going from side to side just like piercingly glued to uh, the feathers pounces out how would a cat girl pounce would she like do something where like she gets ready to pounce you know like how a cat kind of curls up how would that work with a uh, human anatomy I don't know so would, would she take a fighting stance <laughs> you know like karate so anyway continuing with the this last paragraph here for part six with the cat teaser hold the teaser by one end and wave the decorated end near your cat's paws see that's a good sentence instead of just repeating oh there's feathers on it the, the feathered end to it then that makes sense decorated and that that's actually a good word choice hold the decorated end near your cat's paws gently flick it upward she may try to jump to catch it aside uh, if i keep hesitating over like to say he it she and i'm being inconsistent with it the article is also inconsistent with it. i'm trying to just make it she because we're doing genetically engineered cat girls as uh, is the comparison here units 2.7 Give your cat some attention. Mm -hmm. If you have been ignoring your cat lately, you may notice that your cat has become less affectionate than usual. This means that your cat could be upset and lonely. You can apologize to your cat by spending time with it. This could be as simple as reading a book or listening or listening to music next to your cat. I thought you said, I was going to say, read a book to your cat. I mean, if it's a genetically engineered cat girl, she'd appreciate you reading a book. And if she's a, let's say that she's a Belgian and that her first language is French, and it'd be a very strong gesture of good faith to read together if you want to improve your French. And you'd like take a step back and go, you know, this would work with human relationships too. But then it feels even more absurd to consider, hey, I'm dating a girl and I want to learn her language. She speaks French as her first language. I want to get to know her better and do something that's meaningful with our time together. It seems like an absurd thing to say, hey, could, could we spend some time where I read this simple book with you and you help me out with that? Because a lot of it's like, oh, you're on your own to improve, buddy. There's just more freedom in my mind when I think of something that's a completely fictional situation because I, the realistic situation is just so depressing whenever you think about it. Thus, uh, I, I do not like writing about human human interactions. And I actually made some comment about that where it's like, I really don't have many actual human interactions uh, across my books in general, because so many of the interactions are with some kind of like fictional thing, like an android or a genetically engineered something. And that's also to have like a fresh and novel perspective on things when most people don't have fresh and novel perspectives on stuff. So you can't really stretch into any interesting ground by being mundane or like being like really jarring of a modern American college student would not react in this way or someone who, I don't know, whatever, someone who's like just a wage slave just trying to get through life would not react in this way. It's really hard for me to think like that. So having a a completely fantastical situation or a completely fantastical type of character like a genetically engineered cat girl allows me for that freedom without just stopping and going uh this is cringe and you could say that uh the cat girl thing is cringe in itself but it's that like level of absurdity that allows you to explore those realms of thoughts without cringing at it it lets you laugh at it it's the whole point being able to express things in a way that allows you to express those things freely so give your cat attention read a book next to it or give her a nice long petting session. Wonderful phrasing. It could also mean that you have to set aside time to play with your cat. Sorry, this is written in a very odd way. Set aside some time to give your cat attention. Cuddle with your cat, absolutely. That's important. If you, I would argue, so that's the end of the paragraph, I would argue that it would be cat abuse, it would be pet abuse to deprive your cat of attention. If I have a pet dog and I'm like, my really annoying neighbors where I just leave them outside chained up to a tree even though they're barking and whining constantly for like eight hours out of the day and I just leave them out there because I don't want them in like my small apartment and whatever the heck I'm just gonna let 
let them bark and just ignore or whatever. It's disgusting. The way that my neighbors treat their dogs is disgusting like that. And I've approached them about it and I've, I've tried to say, you know, you need, you need to give more attention to them because they're not happy. They're, they're very frustrated and very loud and this is very annoying as well. But that is absolutely animal abuse in my eyes. It's deprivation of attention. You are basically putting that dog in solitary confinement. I mean, yeah, it's outside, but yeah, it's chained up. Yeah, it's very uncomfortable. No, it's not getting any attention towards it. So that's a very bad thing. However, if I take this comparison and look at it towards humans, I'm going to need to write an entire freaking chapter, or this is going to be an absolute theme, is deprivation of affection leads to insanity. It is not healthy to be deprived of affection for a long period of time. And even like, you know, being deprived of socialization is a, a terrible thing. Here's actually a different aside that I want to go on. A friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, was working in a situation where he does not have his family living close to where he's at. And I, like he's living abroad from where his home country is. So he's living in a different country, but he had a really great work situation in terms of the people that he was around. There were a lot of very intellectually elite people in his job and after his job contract ended which is he had a very long job contract with him almost almost 10 years where he was struggling to find another job that would be in the same situation he really lucked out with him being in a really good situation before so he took something that was a much humbler job but was absolutely miserable with how isolating it was because he didn't have the social connections and he didn't have the intellectual stimulation it was just show up and do your work go through the motions and you don't have anyone in this town who cares about you you live very far away from any sorts of opportunities to interact with people and you're going to start questioning what the heck are you doing with your life you are deprived of any close social interactions at all and when he described this to me my first instinct was yeah i've been living with that sort of situation for a very extended period of time it's absolutely miserable and no human should have to go through that and my friend pointed out to me, it's like, this is how you've been living for a long time. And I thought that like, you know, we, we had parody where neither of us have like a, a wife and kids, even though it, it would be so much better for our mental health if we did have a, a stable family that we were you know, part of and we were raising. It's something that we kind of lamented over. And so there was a feeling before that we were kind of on parody with this, but he realized how much that, uh, that work situation really was keeping him afloat in terms of emotional stability and having a sense of fulfillment and something that gave a sense of life to his days. When that was taken away from him, that gave him a, a different perspective, a new appreciation for his life. How the heck do you not feel absolutely miserable at every turn in the day? And I do it through a disassociation by writing a ridiculous amount about fantastical situations with genetically engineered cat girls for domestic ownership, of course. But not everyone can be such a connoisseur of words and literature Richer as myself. I don't want to go too far into this because I'm a god snowflake shit. And even though I'm trying to be open with uh, voice recordings, there's still some like things that I instinctively recoil from. It's like, I don't know if I can express this right. So there's a genetic component to the capability to feel religious experiences. 